Right, we're ready to go. Okay. So welcome everyone again. Thank you for joining us this week. It's a little bit different. Normally we tend to do Ireland or the UK or a mixture of all of those or Africa. But this time we're doing something um, that sort of uh, piqued uh, Geo's and my interest. So once again, Siobhan Bernarath, the owner of Adams and Butler, um, and we're specialists for Ireland, UK and for Africa. So a few years ago, we learned that Ellerman House had an amazing um, sort of little trip that you could do to the Antarctica overnight or for a day etc so we thought it was amazing so we, we put on our website and we were marketing it but then uh, about two weeks ago uh, we had clients and we did booking uh, with Aurora Safari Camp a corporate client that we were doing something for up in the Arctic Circle in Sweden and we just discovered that they had a Kenyan connection so we thought wow there's you know a Kenyan connection with the Arctic and then you have the South African connection with the Antarctica. So we thought it would be a nice idea to sort of explore it in depth because it's something that people don't think of. And I think the idea of going to Africa and doing, you know, a day trip um, to the Antarctica is fantastic. So um, in addition to that, we've also asked Alex Walker, who uh, owns Serian, and because he does a lot of stuff that's off the beaten track. So our friends from Sweden do stuff to the ecologies, etc. in uh, Kenya, but then Alex does stuff that is not the norm. So if you really want to discover a destination, it's something uh, really worth considering. So uh, we've invited him on as well. So we have um, Ellerman House, we've White Desert, we've Serian, we've the Aurora Safari Camp, and then one of our other partners is the Ice House in Sweden. And so again, uh, we have them at the end. So you're all very, very welcome. And I think we'll just go straight in and meet Al from Ellerman House. Hey, I'm just going to start with, just before we go, I just want to show a map for everyone, all these locations, because they're all very far away. So here is Ellerman House in Cape Town. I'll just zoom out to get an idea. Elle will tell us about all the view and the amazing property that it is. Let me just get a zoom out. Brilliant. Thanks, Gio. I'm just going to go over. Tell. Okay, thank you so much, Siobhan. That's a lovely introduction. And it's always great to be part of your webinars. I find them so well attended and really good fun. Um, my name's Elle. I'm actually based in Scotland and I look after the UK and European markets for Ellerman House. There's an amazing team down in Cape Town, Sasanda, looking after sales in our other source markets, Ailsa looking after revenue, Lindy on reservations, and the wonderful Paul Bruce Brand, who heads up the team as general manager. Um, without further ado, I'm going to show you a little video of Ellerman House to give you a glimpse of what we're all about, and then hand you over to Paul, who hopefully still has some light and is still on property um, at the stunning Ellerman House in Cape Town. So if you can show the video, Gio. Thank you. Discover a world between mountain and sea. Find yourself in the lap of luxury, in a place where time behaves differently and abides by its own set of rules. Celebrate a nation by living in a home that exemplifies a country. Taste and embrace a culture. Allow yourself to be hosted by a family and tended by the best. An oasis in the heart of the mother city.
Now, imagine this house is yours. House. 25 years of excellence. Gosh, I still get goosebumps every time I watch that video and I saw that uh, some comments in the chat uh, you're having the same feeling. Really, I think what Ellerman House does is, is showcase the very best of South Africa, whether it be art, food, wine, the gardens, or the wonderful hospitality that we have there. Um, we offer some incredible experiences for guests, whether they're on property or off. Um, um, you can go diving for diamonds up the west coast but i think the ultimate experience has to be white desert so let me without further ado pass you over to paul who's on property and then he'll hand over to kaylee and mindy who are also at ellerman house lucky them thank you hi guys hi paul <laughs> hi everyone can you can you all hear me yes perfect can you all hear me? We can hear you perfectly. All right, well, welcome to Element House. Um, instead of a static view, I thought I'd actually take you on a little tour. I know you just watched the video, but I just want you to get, give you a little bit of a feel for when you arrive here. It really is a home, and, and that's, a way, that's why we love li working here and living here and just experiencing it with you. So I'm gonna take you for a little walk now and Hang on, I'm just gonna turn that around. You'll see that we really have got a magnificent art collection, probably the most represent representative South African art collection in the world. Every wall and every room has original art. We've got our own contemporary gallery um, leading through into the areas here. We've got a piano, which is often used by some top musicians. And then sadly, we've got the coldest day that there's been in a long, long time today. Normally you'd have a beautiful sun <laughs> drought now. But yeah, today's a little bit gloomy, but that's Bantry Bay in front of us. Um, there we've got Lovejoy and Paul that would normally greet you with a cocktail. So when you do come here, we actually made our own wine during lockdown, which has just got a five-star rating. Yeah, and this is the test, which is waiting for all the guests to come back. We, we're actually getting quite a few back at the moment. You wouldn't think so right now, but it is a little bit chilly. But we had our first 12 US guests in the last two weeks, which we're pretty excited about. Uh, yeah, so the city, a lot of people have a misperception Far, we're far out from the city. We're literally a 10 minute drive. That's a city over there. But one has a feeling that you're far away from everything. You'll see there the grounds are very, are very large. And you never really have the feeling that COVID protocols negatively impact you because naturally you have a lot of space to yourself. And as Al says, we try and showcase the best of South Africa from these indigenous gardens to the art, to the music. We have um, beautiful music concerts with some of South Africa's top musicians uh, in our exclusive wine gallery. I'm walking you up here. In the main house, we have got 11 rooms. The main house 
I, I know you did see most of it in the video, so I'm not going to repeat it. I think the important thing that we always focus on as well is the experience. You know, there's one having wonderful views, but the big thing about Element House is we really want to showcase experiences and partnering with the likes of BMW just created a beautiful art vehicle um, with BMW. And we always we try and create something exceptional, something different something that people remember for the rest of their lives. That vein, our collaboration with White Desert is, it's integral to what we do. So it was a natural thing for us to reach out and find an experience that was mind blowing, find an experience, a partners that we could really work close with. So hang on a second, I'm just gonna show you one last view. I don't wanna interfere with the sound on that computer. So I think we're going to, okay, we're going to walk around here. This is a five-bedroom villa here. And yeah, we'd love to welcome you back in, under normal circumstances again. Um, but for now, I'm going to take you across to Mindy and Kaylee are just waiting in the lounge and we're going to sit together. So let me hand over to the wonderful Mindy and Kaylee who are with White Desert. They're right over there and they're going to cross over to their computer, to the other computer screen. <laughs> okay, well, let's carry on here. And I'm just going to turn it around. There we go. <laughs> this is what you call uh, multitasking and uh, sharing like friends. <laughs> our, uh, our computer just died. So I'm, I'm uh, sorry, we're, um, yeah, we're, Paul's going to get the cord, but we will uh, go on from now. Um, so we're going to talk about White Desert. Uh, so Patrick and Robin, who founded White Desert, are good friends of mine, and um, it really is quite a small family-oriented team who, um, and also from a place where they are, they are polar explorers. They're world record holders, well, Patrick is, and, and Robin was the first South African woman to reach the South Pole. So they are um, a glorious couple with a big dream and a big vision. And Patrick's also an aviation enthusiast. And so he, I suppose, has the attitude of nothing is really impossible. And uh, so he's, he thought, why not organize um, a luxury camp in the middle of Antarctica, the world's seventh continent, and probably one of the most remote places on earth, and, uh, and access it through Cape Town via private jet. And so that's how we've, we've joined up with Element House here. And Element obviously do um, promote a lot of our greatest day. So it's probably the quickest and um, easiest way of getting into the interior of Antarctica. Um, it's only a five hour flight from Cape Town town so super easy to get to um, and then you get to spend some time really on the ice uh, you know captivated by these incredible vistas um the the sound of silence and and you know just just realizing that you're the on sound the, the sound of silence <laughs> and just realizing that you're actually at the end of the earth um, is just so special. And of course, we don't only do the uh, Greatest Day experiences, which is the 24 hours um, down to Antarctica and back. Um, we do also have our ultra luxury lodge, uh, which way Oasis, uh, which is actually um, based on the, in the interior of, of Antarctica. And we do a lot more um, kind of adventures from there um, with trips between five and seven, seven nights. Um, and basically you can get to go to the South Pole itself. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a really wonderful, amazing journey that not many people uh, in the world ever, ever get to do. Uh, there's probably only a few hundred people that get down to the South Pole every year. So less than people that climb Everest, which yeah. is quite an interesting sort of comparison these days. Incredible. And, um, and obviously being, being able to experience it, we do uh, spend a couple of hours uh, sleeping uh, near to where the pole is. So you can really get a feel for, you know, how the original explorers would have, would have had to go through. Um, and then of course you get back to your beautiful polar pods um, at Wichaway Oasis and, and live in the lap of luxury. And the other thing I think worth mentioning is the wildlife aspect as well. So we're the only camp that can get access to the emperor penguins. There's a colony of about 28,000 individuals and at 
about a metre and a half tall um, with no natural predators. It is absolutely incredible to be able to sit with these animals. So we talk about, you know, gorilla journeys and the, the chances to, to sit with those kind of creatures. Very different, but extremely similar in terms of that moment that sort of touches you where these huge, enormous birds are, have got thousands of chicks everywhere, almost in like little creches where the animals sort of look after each other's babies. And you can sit, we don't get closer than five meters, but if they come closer to us, you sit and you watch and you are part of their natural world. And as Kaylee said, you know, it's silent. There's nothing there. You are at the end of the earth. And the other thing that's quite interesting, there's no smell, it's, it's ice, it's snow, it's actually the oldest ice in the world, crushed over time by weights and millennia where the snow compacts. And so the ice turns this iridescent, almost neon blue, um, where, so we're going to our, our friends at the ice bar in the north, we've got our ice bar at the runway uh, in, in the south. Um, and just to give you a sense of the remoteness, it costs, once you add up all of the sort of, um, I suppose, traveling <laughs> of, for a can of Coke, um, the can of Coke costs about $38 once you actually drink it on the ice. Um, in terms of the smell from the penguins, we're, we're quite lucky. I know that there are some colonies um, from the, the peninsula where you're accessing it from South America where the smell can get quite overpowering. Um, of course, you know, you're, you're in a huge colony and there is a smell, but it's, um, it's not the, the extreme sort of stench that you can hear um, is told from the, the peninsula side. And then, of course, um, it's not just uh, about going to see the wildlife. Um, there's so much to do and see in Antarctica. You know, we've got two kind of different um, types of adventures that we do. So one's more adventure, you know, doing the climbing up the Nunatak uh, mountain ranges that, that we have around, you know, being able to traverse the ice uh, with, with ropes and pulleys, um, doing abseiling, abseiling down, down the mountains. And then we have the more leisure style uh, very much more relaxed, you know, going out on a, in our four by four or six by sixes um, on a on a white safari, um, going to explore around um, Antarctica, having champagne picnics, um, you know, being able to spend time uh, looking over the ice waves which are just incredible you know they look like the, the sea has frozen in waves and then you've got these beautiful iridescent blue rivers that, that go between them and the ice caves and well. the ice caves as well where you're walking in and, and again that iridescent blue is just surrounds you um, I think one of my favorite stories is actually on the ice you can kind of see the sunshine reflect through the ice uh, and come back at you as that like blue blue color yeah. yes, I think we've got a so I think show of uh, me just to you before that can we just ask a few questions um i remember a cost of something like fourteen thousand. someone has just asked the cost for the day trip from element so how much is it roughly yeah so, so fourteen thousand five hundred dollars per person for that trip and we've just got it on set departures um and we've got quite a limited uh season so it's november through until uh early february because of the summer summer weather and um, and it's 24 hours of sunshine because you're at the pole. So um, it's more a, a, a temperature um, reason. Perfect, brilliant. And I think everything else is covered. It is Emperor Penguin. Uh, you covered the question about the smell near the penguin. So yeah, so Gio, I think we can go over to the video.
So just there was a question there just very quickly, Kaylee, maybe you can answer it. Um, it was uh, what year is the G550? I know the slide you said I think was four to five hours. And how Sorry, fit Hon, we've got some technical be? challenges here. Siobhan, please say that again. What so was the, the question, question was, what year is the G550 and how long is the flight? The flight you said was four to five hours? So yeah, it's about five hours from Cape Town to Wolfsbang runway, which is our runway in Antarctica. And the plane we use is generally a Gulfstream 550. Um, but we're also, uh, what year is it? Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not entirely sure. We can get back to you on that. But we're also looking at um, at using a Boeing this season as well, which is a slightly larger aircraft. And do people need to be fit? That was the final question. No, not at all. Perfect. You can be t completely unfit. Fantastic. And I was just that I remember seeing um, um, a comment that was that I saw from a contact and asked that um, this experience is uh, what it, it takes the hardship out of discovery. And I think that's amazing. Like it truly sums it up. So thanks yeah. so many for sharing that with us. Thank you so much for having us, Siobhan. Really appreciate it. Thank okay. Hi. So Gia, we're off now to see Alex. Alex Walker of Sarian. Hello, Alex. You're Hold on. on. Am, am I unmuted? You're unmuted. Uh, yes. Okay, great. Uh, hi, guys. So, Alex Walker from uh, Serian, um, Tanzania, Kenya, and, and the rest of, of East Africa. We do a lot of um, so specialist guiding is really our key element um, that maybe I'm going to talk about today. Um, our camps, our permanent camps, are based in the Serengeti and Maasai Mara. So, we're sort of really migration centric. But our uh, DNA is really all about walking safari. It's, it's all about getting off the beaten track, getting away from everybody else, and just disconnecting. Um, you, you, you don't necessarily need to go to the Antarctic to get into the quiet spaces, I guess, is the, is the point. Um, being able to get out there and, and really turn off the phone and, and leave the world behind. I think it's sort of, a, it's even more sort of pertinent in today's world. I mean, here we are sitting on a Zoom call. Um, we're so connected, we're so tied into our in sort of Zen type environment. Um, and you form these relationships with, with the bush, with the people that you're with, with the trackers. And it's about slowing down. And I think that's really the key element of, of what we're trying to do. I'm not sure which video we're showing right now, but I, I, I know that I'll um, give a couple more that are maybe a little bit more pertinent to this message. Um, I think it's trying to find something a bit more meaningful, um, getting away from the pure lux and the, uh, the, the, the beautiful tents and the amazing rooms. It's about getting right back to basics and, and getting into sleeping on the floor, sleeping out under the stars, um, walking, not, not hiking and, and pushing yourself um, to, to the sort of hardest edge. You don't have to be super fit. It's, uh, it's really about finding the space where you start to interact, where you start to listen with your ears, you start to smell, you start to engage all your senses you know we too often we're just engaged into our um, our eyesight we're engaged in our phones and that add sort of culture that we have the the idea that you can just sit back i mean quite often what we'll do is we'll take take you to space and you just sit and relax we'll pull out some paint some some uh just simple watercolors uh, you don't need to know how to paint. It's not about that finished picture that you, you can sort of want to put on a wall. It's really about the process. You start to look at the colors, the, the depth, the gaps in the trees, the, the, the shape of the clouds. You know, maybe there's a giraffe or an elephant in there. Maybe you're sitting over a water hole. And while you're sort of going through this process, some warthogs or some elephants will come in. It's about finding a tree next to that same water hole climbing up into it and creating a sort of nest in the top, putting a canvas bit in the top, putting a bedroll up there and sleeping out under the, the full moon while the elephants come into that water at night. So it, it's really, um, I think what we want to show is, is there's a whole different way of doing safari. Um, it's back to the days of old. It's back to really feeling that sort of dust 
between your toes or you know in your boots um a bit of bush law learning that sort of culture that's being being lost i mean sharon you, you know exactly uh from your time in samburu that these traditional cultures are being left behind people are being ed better educated um but sadly at the same time they're leaving that old school bush law behind and it's actually got so much to give us um so i think what, what uh what we're really trying to push people to do is give us a little time, not just three days or four days. We need a week, 10 days, two weeks. When I started doing safaris, I was doing 45 day trips, 30 um, day trips. And those were our standard day to day stuff. And we, we just, you, you just felt, you know, you, you, you spend those one or two, three days, you get rid of the city and you forget that world behind you. You forget the phones, you put your computers down and slowly you start to become a part of what's going on. On the sort of the, the, the real, the safaris that most people are doing, you'll be busting around, you'll be driving along, you see all these amazing things. I mean, let's not put them down because a safari is always going to imprint on you for life. But when you walk, you, you get into the space where you just quiet, you 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 first day you're walking along you're noisy you're clunking along you're asking lots of questions you're chit-chatting away day two you're starting to listen to the sounds you're starting to be a little bit aware of what's going on and day three you're just silent and and really it's just sign language between you and and you find that space and you just sit and you wait and the world happens for you um you know that when you're driving you come and you bust into a situation you see an elephant it sort of reacts to you it runs away a lion suddenly wakes up and sort of moves off. When you go and pick a space and you sit there, everything just comes into that space and it just walks in and you, you're part of nature. They, they don't see you as your threat anymore. You, you're just there and they don't even notice you. Water will just come munching along and literally just sort of right past you. I think one of the greatest sightings I've ever had, everybody sort of asks you is, uh, what, what about, um, you know, what are the most, the, most dangerous things that ever happened to you what's the greatest sort of experience well one of the greatest experiences was walking in the evening heading back into camp and from about 300 meters away you could see this little dick dick couple uh, the dick dick's a tiny little antelope stands about two foot tall and they're just playing and messing around and coming down the same sort of pathway that we're going to and we just sat down and waited and slowly, slowly, they kept on coming, kept on coming, five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And then the next thing, they're right on top of us. And literally where the computer screen is, that's where they ended up. And you can see this sort of big eyes just open wide and they're looking at you. Nose is twitching and the eyes are sort of going wide and they're looking around. And you're really in sort of like breathing distance. I mean, touch, reach out and touch this little animal. But because we just sat so still and it stayed there for a good sort of 30 seconds, 35, 40 seconds, and then suddenly it bolted. But one of the most amazing sightings, the most sort of incredible moments, because you, you're just privileged to enjoy these spaces. Um, and by doing it on foot, you just add an, a whole other element to, to what's going on. Um, but I can't even read the whole and what's going on inside here. I can see some comments coming through. So, it, you know, I think a lot of it, those walking trips is challenging who you are, a little bit pushing the envelope. And, and people tend to sort of always rock back onto the safe side of, of um, what safari is. And, and that's why we've sort of seen more development along the, um, the luxury, the lifestyle element of it. Um, and people have sort of forgotten about just, you, there's a nice saying sort of, um, nothing grows, grows in the shade of a tree. You know, you really need to sort of test yourself. You need to push yourself a little bit. And, you know, we'll do that by taking people out early morning, say four o'clock, it's still dark. Um, the lions are roaring, the hyenas are there. And you'll just go and find a space and you'll settle somebody down there and you say, just sit there. We'll be back at daybreak. Go another few hundred meters and you leave the next person. Another few hundred meters, you leave the next person. And they just 
sat there in the dark and very, very nervous, you know, because the lions are there, the hyenas are calling. And what they don't know is that we've dropped one of our trackers about 50 yards behind them, just sitting there quietly, just looking after them. But you're really challenged now because you, you're scared, you're fearful. You can't see because it's totally dark. You can hear, and, and at nighttime, the sound is, is immense, it's, it's amplified. And you're just imagining that little rustle is that lion that you can hear in the distance where actually it's just a, a small mouse or, or maybe a, even a, a grasshopper or something like that. And your mind takes on all sorts of sort of uh, extended sort of, you just, you, you're amplifying everything. And it, it's such an, an intense experience that when you break away from it, everybody sort of comes back. When you finally come back, they're, they're, because they're quiet, they've got nobody to talk to. And when you come back and collect them, that sort of, the, the fear is all sort of amplified and they're chatting and, and, and they're very voluble. But when they sit back and they, they examine it, you know, when you're sitting around having your cup of tea afterwards, it, it's given them a great sense of space and, and sense of self. And, Really, it's opened up the, those other senses that we just, we forget. We, we're totally unaware of in this day-to-day -day world. We're in this sort of closeted environment. We're in a controlled room with um, air conditioning. We're in a car with air conditioning. We're, um, sort of everything's comfortable and, and we, 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 we make shortcuts for ourselves. We, we are very um, trying to create this environment all the time where we don't have to stress or we don't challenge ourselves. And I think in order to grow, you, you need to challenge yourself a little bit. And you've got to just push that envelope and try something different. So you can do this for five, six, seven nights. Three nights is not enough. You need five or six, seven nights. And at the end of it, you're going to come out just in this intense sort of Zen-like feeling. Uh, you actually need to go to an element house. You need to go to a Lamu. You need to go to these places actually to break back into the world because you, you're just so in tune with nature at that stage that it takes a good three or four days now to break back into the real world and get on a plane and go home. Um, I maybe sort of, I, I don't know what, which, which video we've got, but it might give you a little yeah, we'll show sort of the, idea what we're about. Yeah, we have here and then we'll go on to questions uh, in a minute. Get an idea.
Wow, that was an amazing video. It really conveyed the essence. Yeah, it's sort of, I mean, that's really sort of focused on on, on the camps in the Mara, but the, the, the idea is exactly the same. Just slow down, you know, everybody's in a rush. Listen to what nature's got to give you, I think is the real key. It's very funny because when I'm in Ireland, I never sleep more than six hours or when I'm traveling. But when I stay um, with the family in Samburu, like in the bush, I could sleep 13 hours, no problem. And I find it very funny because I'm sleeping on the ground. I don't even have a mattress. I'm sleeping on the ground in a mosquito nest and I can sleep for 13 hours comfortably and I have a great deep sleep. I can go to sleep looking at the stars and you wake up with the sound of the animals. You know? That's a, that's a great outdoors for you. I think anywhere in the world, you know, if you get away from the, the screen time and, and the computers and things, your mind will find its space and relax, that's for sure. And I see you also do the Congo, which is very interesting because people want new destinations. I didn't know you did the Congo. Yeah, we do. I mean, with our, so we do a lot of the specialist guiding sort of elements, myself, Chris Tamper, John Muller. Um, uh, we've got also James and, and uh, Stephen Kipuyu and, and these guys. So everybody has their sort of little um, specialist skill, whether it's a photographic workshop, whether it's a, a great walking safari, whether it's really getting into the sort of the deep depths of, of, of Central African Republic or even um, Cameroon. Um, it's, it's, I th those are really my holidays. I think that's sort of when I, when I had a place that I want to go and see, then I sort of managed to persuade a few people to come join. But you also like um, a lot of people, they tend to know about the tribes in Kenya, but they don't know about the tribes in Tanzania. But you do some play, like sort of opportunities for you to meet tribes people in uh, Tanzania as well don't you yeah absolutely I mean uh, and again you know I mean uh, we, we try and get off the beaten track we're, we're not operating in, in um, places where tourism has sort of really um, changed the uh, the face of, of, of that sort of thing I mean tourism in, in many ways it, it, it is quite damaging to communities and, and traditional um, people because it, you know suddenly it becomes about the money and, and therefore it becomes a little bit of sort of plastic and manufactured and the get off the beaten track and away from it you're really interacting with genuine people and I think what what we're selling or uh, in, in we it's really to become a traveler and not a tourist um, you want people to engage and when you get into the wilderness wildlife areas we're talking about Hadza Bay Bushman or whether you're talking about Datoga or really remote Maasai or, or further south when you get into um, the, the Waha and the Hehe and, and the guys. Bush people are very gentle, but they're very shy. And you need three, four days to establish a relationship where you're not just coming across as this very polite personality, where you're being the person that everybody expects you to be. Um, but at that stage, you know, everything sort of warms up and opens up and, and everybody, you, you start to see the genuine self. Um, and, and those are the things that imprint on you. When you go home, you're going to remember that. It's uh, You'll remember that beautiful line or the moment the elephant charged you and something like that. But they're really the thing you'll remember five years, ten years later with the well, people that you spend time with. It's true. It's those moments with people that are the memorable moments. Yeah, yeah. Um, no matter where you are in the world, I mean, it could be doing a great cooking course in, in Tuscany, or, or it could be exploring the North or the South Poles, you know, if you spend time with people um, and let them get past that sort of polite surface, you, you, you start to dig into the real gold dust. I think the, like the people in the Adams and Butler that are on the call is we always say our clients, hey, they arrive at tourists and they leave a traveler. And the other thing we always say is we, when clients travel with us they just don't see and do but they feel and engage and you said both of those in one sentence oh thank you i can see one of the the, the questions is like how many travelers do you accept on a walking trip well I'm, everything we do is um we don't mix anybody so whether it's a single person or, or a group of eight um it, it's all uh tailored to the individual so it's exclusive use so I think, Jill, we better go on to Frederick now. So that was brilliant, Alex. Thank you very, very much. So um, if anyone has any 
more questions, please keep on putting them in the chat box and Alex will answer any that we don't know how to. Um, and he can give probably um, quick answers to stuff as well. Um, and then uh, we can always go back in the end as well. So, hi, Frederick, how are you? Hello, can you hear me where you are? Yes. Perfect. Thank I you. just wanted to show a map right. first to show where Frederick is. Um, just one second. If anyone there can see are. my screen. We so are at 66 Aurora degrees Sun. north. Yes, so very, and I left here so you can see how high up you are compared to North America. So I'll just stop sharing and I'll hand over to you, Frederick. Hello, everyone. It's uh, fantastic to get invited to this uh, forum here. Uh, and when I've listened to uh, the Antarctica and the South African and then the, the Kenyan stories that are amazing, I realized here we have like a little um it has like melted together here everything <laughs> so the story is that i am i uh, i am a photographer so as alex said uh, you know photo tours you, you you you're a traveler you want to dig deeper in culture nature uh you want to learn photography as you travel um and that's my background uh first just commercial nature photography but then tours as well so i ended up in kenya where you are alex uh, late 90s, uh, did photo tours, uh, spent a lot of time in the Mara, north of the Mara. Um, and then uh, when I moved, I've lived a couple of years there, and then, then I moved back to Sweden, to northern of Sweden, Arctic Sweden, where we are now. Uh, and I realized why not build this, um, like the small, medium sized satellite or bush camp that you. Uh, that you have sometimes in East Africa that like are a satellite from a larger camp or something. And that's where we are now. Aurora Safari Camp uh, in Arctic Sweden, uh, just out of the Arctic Circle. Uh, and uh, well here, everything you said, Alex, there, basically you take that, that you come down to bed six, you want to like meet yourself again, you want to hear the sounds, you, you want to hear silence. Uh, uh, and that's what you get here. I, I could just say what Alex said we have taken to an Arctic Sweden uh, experience in, in the woods of Arctic Sweden. I am from here, from this region. We are one hour by car from Luleå airport at the Gulf of Bosnia. Uh, and uh, I go down seven generations in this area. Uh, and I started this uh, project that I called it from the start, Aurora Safari Camp. Uh, in uh, 2013, uh, mainly for photo tours. So all the two seasons was just about photo tours. Uh, but then uh, uh, we got so much attention basically. So we, we just need to, to take care of other travelers that wanted to come here. It's small. You see one room behind me, uh, comfy tented rooms, uh, heated. So it's not cold accommodation. Uh, and we have a fantastic floating sauna uh, and we have a dining that's actually just there at the dining. And we, are, we have just yes, for the winter season. Winter is fading away. Uh, and at this small camp, you come, you can be all private or you maybe share the camp. You have a private room and you are here with, you know, four to six other guests. And we roam the forests, uh, woodlands and the frozen lakes and rivers of, of uh, Swedish Lapland from here and learn about Arctic Sweden and our basically the same as, as uh, Alex told about there as well. You get into our lifestyle uh, and the local people. I, will, I am local. Our, our guides has become local. So you get into our lifestyle basically uh, and be, will become a part of that. So you, you shouldn't stay too short as Alex said as well. And uh, yeah, you come down in pace, you get close to nature and what we have learned here, uh, many has done fantastic uh, East African safaris where you go down in pace uh, and the intensity, as Alex said, when you are with all the, the predators uh, around you and other animals, buffaloes, elephants, they're amazing. They send out a lot of energy. But here, here you can walk and roam mm, uh, all without, no animals here. There are no animals here that can threaten you. Maybe a female moose with a calf if you don't uh, read the signs from her, but... So that's also like a freedom we have here that is like a contrast to Africa, but 
but um, yeah, we have a lodge as well. It has um, expanded. So we have um, uh, another house in a small, small Arctic village with uh, six uh, bedrooms that we rent private. We rent the suite private or the whole property private. And uh, there, from there, we travel into the circle uh, with snowmobiles in, in winter. Uh, in and and here the area here, yeah, Swedish Lapland, that we call the destination, Arctic Sweden. It's like half the UK in size, but we are only two hundred and eighty thousand people. Uh, so so you don't. It's not a crowd here. Uh, and where we are in Rona River Valley here, uh, it's only five, six small accommodation sites, all like embedded in the in the wild, close to this small Arctic community where we are 500 people living. And the areas we roam to learn about our lifestyle and the nature and the wilderness here is, is thousands of square kilometers uh, that we basically like own uh, when we're out. So, so it's, it's a blessing to operate here, I have to say, and, and take small groups of guests into the woods here. Well, what we do then, we will see a, a video as well. Um, so we usually like, Snowmobiles. Yeah, I have one actually there. There is one. <laughs> uh, snowmobiles is like our land cruiser stand. Uh, and then uh, we have snowshoes and we have have uh, some traditional Swedish kicks, kick sleds. You have to Google that. And we have Nordic skis uh, and uh, and and we explore and and you learn about. It's like a winter educational here, uh, where you learn about how to be very comfortable in cold temperatures and, and during, okay, you're in comfort, heated rooms, nice beds, good food, three course dinners, but it's still like basics. Uh, so it's like an, an educational about how to, how to be in comfort in, in the Arctic. Uh, yeah, and the, basically the, yeah, sorry. We have a short video, but please finish. Oh yeah, uh, no, I'm happy. Show show the video, and you will see some. Oh, some we have, yeah, put it on, and then we'll come back.
fantastic. Thanks. Frederick, there's a question there. Where do you think is the best place for the Northern Lights? Would you say Aurora? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't really say that, even if I like my own place. <laughs> But you need to be uh, uh, quite far north. You be, need to be between latitude 64 and 72, and you are at 66 where we are. And you need to be in a place where there's no light pollution. So you need to be away from, from larger villages or towns or cities. Uh, and you also need uh, clear skies. So <laughs> chances for clear weather in uh, between uh, late August and early April, where you're able to see, see the uh, Northern Lights. So, so that's the parameters, basically. And we are, of course, in a good place because we are away from all the light pollution, two kilometers away from closest, even small village. Uh, and we have uh, where we are, it's a large frozen lake. Uh, yeah. So, so it's a good spot. Good chances. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. And it says, thanks, Frederick. Talk about the bucket list. Um, yeah. The, oh. All right. Uh, the bucket list, of course. So when you travel, you mean traveling to the Arctic, the Arctic bucket list. I think so. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it can be so different for so many. And I have to go back to uh, Alex there as well. For some, you, you might come here and you want to be going to do dog sledding, which is fantastic with huskies. And you go out in the woods with those and you get to drive your own sled. And, and, and you got to see the Northern Lights. Let's say that you are lucky. You get to see the Northern Lights, which is like 50-50. Uh, and you, you, you click the box for the bucket list for all those things. But then it's, then it's like Alex said, sitting here by the fireplace, having a good meal. There's not another person in 100 square kilometers. Uh, and you feel all the stress. You don't hear any sounds. The sound is, um, yeah, the sound is silence. Uh, and you feel how, you're, you, how you even, we have even had people here, guests, they started to cry and they don't know why. When, when, when tension releases when you are so so that's on the bucket list should be and I believe that the people last week were mesmerized they delighted it the corporate group they loved it oh we had a good chat with with, yeah. uh, with, with your corporate group from all over the from all over the US they were fantastic yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah great uh, great broadcast live so as well. we have another question when is the main opening dates for Aurora hmm we do winter, winter it's open from uh, uh, early December. Uh, that's when we usually have snow and ice conditions that are good. And then we close in, in late March, early April, like now. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the winter is three different winters. The dark winter, like the, where actually you have a little bit larger chances to see the lights because it's very dark, December, January. Then you have like a fluffy, crispy winter, February into March, and then now spring, winter, more, more lights and there's still a lot of snow and, and uh, but, more, but more time for day activities and not that cold. Right. So that's, that's the winter season. Then we do summer as well, but, but uh, on, on request. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Frederick. So, so thank you. Where we were talking about bucket list, I've just got a, another short video there too. Yeah, so it's a very short video. I think it's only a minute, and it's the ice hotel in. Oh, in uh, yes. We've got another yeah. one first before we go to the ice hotel on your bucket list there. If ah, you want okay. To add. Well, behind us we have basically our glamping sauna. Uh, in summer, this is a hundred square meter deck. You know, with hammocks and kayaks and canoes. And uh, funny enough, we have quite warm water here in the summer between 20 and 25 Celsius. But now it's all freezed into the ice. And we're gonna take a plunge in that little ice hole you see there, uh, with the stairs there. Uh, but before that, we take the advantage of the sauna and, and get warm there. And why do we plunge? Yes. Uh, you get your adrenaline going and you really feel lightweight uh, when you do that. And the first plunge is quite cold, the other ones are actually not. Uh, because you like, you like steaming from the inside, your circulation is going. Ooh. Hello, I'm in the sauna at the Aurora Safari Camp. And you get really steaming hot in there. And when you are hot in your core, in the, the body core, then you are okay to go and have a plunge in the little ice pool. So in a few minutes. Well, here is our firewood heated sauna. So we're heating up 
the rocks. We will throw water on the rocks. And then we will go here, go out and take a plunge in this little pool. All right, steaming hot and here very, very cold. <laughs> but because your core body is quite warm, you're quite all right. It's cold actually. <laughs> oh. Now I have my breathing. So now, now I, the heat is coming from the inside. And first your legs are becoming a bit cold, but I'm quite all right actually. Now I'm coming up. Woo. And now when you're here, you basically just steam. Woo. Ah. Oh. Woo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> actually, we did barbecue down there and did some plunging as well. And actually, 100% of our guests, when we pick them up, uh, they say, no, we're not going to do that. And then it's like 80%, they just love it. And, and half of our guests, they do it multiple times because you feel it. You kind of meet your body with, with that experience. Uh, so it's, it's, it's as, it is as fantastic as to see the Northern Lights we have experienced over the years. Fantastic. Amazing. Amazing. Mm -hmm. and, um, well, it's uh, going down here now, and uh, in a couple of weeks, we don't uh, we have 24-hour daylight instead that we have in summer. And as I said, that sauna is floating and water is reasonably warm, and we have kayaks and canoes, so it's a lot of contrast here in, in this Arctic Sweden that is like both modern but wild at the same time. Uh, so, uh, and you don't same here. You can come whatever, ho however you are, not fit, fit. You're welcome. We'll we'll take care of you. Well, I know the people really enjoyed it last week. So thanks, Monique Frederick. So, Gio, back to you. Do you have the video on the isotel? And I assume they're both a good combination to do together, if possible. Yes, I'm just going to show the video now. It's just short. Unfortunately, Michael couldn't join us today, but uh, we just have a, a sneak peek. Hey, guys. Michael from Isotel here. Hope you guys are having an amazing day. So we're 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle and we're going to give you guys a short sneak peek of the ice hotel. Stay tuned. So we'll start off walking right inside. As you guys can see, everything is made of snow and ice, even that chandelier. Inside here, there's about 35 hotel rooms and this is minus five degrees. And people actually do stay inside here. To your left, you see one of our ice blocks. Right now, we're picking up about a thousand of these from the river to create next winter's ice hotel. And of course, even the chandelier is made of ice. Right in front of us, we have our ceremony hall. And this is where we have all our weddings. So people actually do come here to marry. And everyone wears the regular suits, regular wedding dresses. Average time, roughly 14 minutes. So every year in the ice hotel we have artists coming to create the different rooms and the artists they apply from all over the world to get to, to come here to create the rooms and they have two weeks to create something like this. And you stay in a bed on top of these rainy furs in sleeping bags and the entire trick to stay warm at the hotel during the night is the less clothes you wear the warmer you get. And now we'll walk into my favorite room, Dreaming in a Dream, to see and say hello to Princess. As you can see, it's quite a big difference from the last room we were in. So these rooms, they can look just like anything. It all depends on what the artist had in mind when he or she designed the actual room. So that's Princess, her friend Maniac. And if we walk around here. This is what you see straight from your bed. So 
Now we're in the ice bar, and of course we have to end the video with a drink. So Ronia, please, do us yes. the honor. So we're gonna do a polar fox. Of course, everything is served in our iconic ice glasses as well. That's it. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, that's yeah, great. There we go. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. If you want to unmute yourselves and ask the presenters any questions, and of course, thanks to the presenters as well, our partners for joining us today. And uh, then Rachel and Richard uh, from Adams and Butler and Geo as well for organizing the event. So anyone has any questions, please feel free to mute yourselves or put it in the chat box. A bit different to usual, Geo, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, uh, a little bit. A little bit. It's just like the Hello, going guys. in the wild, but... Uh... Hi. Someone's had a question there. How are you doing? Oh, we're not getting a, an image there. I think they said it was 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. So it's still in Sweden, isn't it? Geo, it stays in Sweden. Yes. yes, it is. And the big difference, I think, is uh, that if you stay at Aurora Safari Camp, your tents are heated. Uh, so you, even though it's minus 25 outside, it's room temperature inside, where in the ICE hotel, it's um, minus five inside your room. So uh, what's on the agenda for next week, Gio? Next week, we've got Richie, and we're looking at... Um, uh, oh, this is, this yeah, is affordable luxury, yeah? Yeah, affordable luxury for the first time visitors to Ireland. Brilliant. Because uh, what happened is, and it's it's the other thing as well, it's quite interesting. One of the people who regularly watched the webinar asked to put together an affordable luxury type itinerary for the people who are booking Ireland for the first time. So if you have any suggestions for webinars, we're delighted to do them. Um, we're hoping to do Namibia is going to be our next African one. And then um, we're also going to be doing gardens, uh, I think, the week after that as well. So thank you very much to everyone um, and see you next week. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.